Welcome back. So today I'm going to talk about a case that most people outside of Canada have never heard of. Most of us are familiar with the Chris Watts case. However, there are many more stories similar to that case that don't get nearly as much publicity, including the story that I'm going to talk about today. And in my opinion, this individual is infinitely worse than Chris Watts. How so? Well, at least Chris Watts confessed his crimes and showed law enforcement where he hid his family's remains. This is the story of John Rollo, and right away you're probably wondering who exactly this is. So most people won't know or remember this case because it happened 46 years ago in 1976. Just one word of caution before we go any further, this case does involve the death of two children under the age of seven years old, so if you want to click out of this video now, I completely understand. So John Rollo murdered his wife and two children 46 years ago. He's still alive, and to this day, he still won't admit his guilt. This story is another dark stain within the Canadian justice system. And if you don't hate this guy now, I promise you, you will by the end of this story. As well, it's going to make you super angry with some of the questionable decisions made within the Canadian justice system over the past 46 years. Some of the decisions made throughout this case were frustratingly horrible, and it could be possibly because domestic violence isn't looked upon the same way in the justice system as stranger-based violence is. And the story also occurred only one year after Canada abolished the death penalty. Otherwise, we may have had a different outcome. Hamilton is a port city in the province of Ontario, with a population of about 540,000 people. The town of Hamilton became the center of a densely populated and industrialized region at the west end of Lake Ontario, known as the Golden Horseshoe. Back in the 1970s, the local economy was led by the steel and heavy manufacturing industries. However, within the last decade, there has been a shift towards the service sector, such as health and sciences. On the morning of August 18, 1976, the Lamont boys, Sean, age 13, and Paul, age 11, were fishing with their mother at Jordan Harbour, just west of St. Catharines, Ontario, about a 40-minute drive from Hamilton. Leaving their mom behind, they were playing along the shore of 20 Mile Creek, when they noticed something unusual floating in the water nearby, and it was a large blue vinyl duffel bag. Being curious, the boys pulled the duffel bag over to land and opened it up. A green garbage bag was inside the duffel bag with something wrapped up in it. They pulled the garbage bag open and took a moment before they realized what they were looking at. It was the body of a little girl, no more than age five years old. The two ran off screaming for their mother and police were called to the scene. And according to police, a 10 pound anchor had been placed in the bag with a little girl in an attempt to weigh the body down. While the crime scene was being secured at Jordan Harbor and the area of the horrific discovery, and the little girl's body was taken to the morgue at St. Catherine's General Hospital, a phone call came in for Hamilton Police Chief Gord Torrance, and that phone call was from a local businessman named Doug Pollington. He and his wife Margaret wanted to report that their 29-year-old daughter Sandra and her two children, Jason 6 and Stephanie 5, had gone missing. Their son-in-law, John George Rollo, had shown up that morning to tell Doug that Sandra had run off with another man, taking the kids with her. John was kind of a mess and looked extremely nervous, and he claimed that he slept in the den of the basement of their home, only to wake up at 9 a.m. on August the 17th to find that his family was gone. The only thing Sandra had taken with her other than her two children was her wallet, and John handed Doug a typewritten letter claiming that Sandra had left it behind. And the letter read, I'm writing this letter to say goodbye and ask you to try to understand what I'm doing, John. I've met someone who I love very much. He's a rich lawyer from out west who I met while working last year. He can give us everything we want. And apparently John begged Doug to talk to a lawyer first before he talked to the police. Sandra, John, and the kids had been at the Pollington's home swimming the day before the three disappeared. Sandra seemed happy and the kids were playful. 
But John seemed a little off that day. He wasn't especially chatty and kind of kept to himself. All summer, Sandra's brother had been trying to coax Jason to jump off the diving board. That day, he managed to get Jason to the edge of the board and convince him to jump. But John was indifferent and didn't seem to care, which Doug thought was unusual because John had always been an attentive father. Sandra had given no indication that she was about to leave. Something like this was not in her character. She was close with her parents, trusting them with everything. She would not have just run off without talking to them about it, especially if she planned on taking the kids. The lawyer that Doug had been speaking with convinced him to call the police. While this was taking place, John was apparently sitting at the kitchen table, sobbing into his hands. However, his mother-in-law was quoted as saying, I didn't see any tears. So John Rollo had apparently already spoken with a lawyer, a man named Dennis Roy, on the evening of Sandra's disappearance. After speaking with this lawyer, he also retained the services of a private investigator named Ronald Arnold in an effort to try and find his family. I think in his mind, he thinks he's behaving like an innocent person should act, but really it's only making him look more guilty. John also told his father-in-law that only Sandra's wallet was missing and that his family's suitcases, clothing, and credit cards were left behind. No woman goes on the run with two children and no clothing. According to court documents, Rollo told Dennis Roy that, quote, Upon finding the note in the master bedroom, he became enraged, tore up the rug in the master bedroom, and took it to the dump. He also told Roy that he ripped up the carpet because it was soiled and smelled, and his wife had complained about this. Dennis Roy also noticed that Rallo's left hand and wrist were injured, and Rallo told him that he had injured it when he had fallen off his bicycle on the evening of August 17, 1976. That's a whole lot of coincidences right there. I mean, I know the first thing I would do if my family disappeared would be to randomly rip up carpet and go for late night bike rides. According to court documents, a neighbor testified that they saw a light on in John's home around 5 a.m. in the morning and witnessed him moving up and down as though he was tearing up a carpet. Which is odd, because he did say he was sleeping in the basement until 9 a.m. in the morning, so this completely contradicts his story. The body of the little girl was examined at the morgue to determine her identity and what had happened to her. According to the Hamilton Spectator, the girl was naked, 3 foot 7, she had bruises on her temples, visible tan lines from a two-piece bathing suit, and a band-aid on her right knee. A post-mortem examination of the little girl disclosed the death was caused by asphyxia. Dr. Ferres, who performed the autopsy, was of the opinion that asphyxia was produced by suffocation due to the application of firm pressure to the face. After taking the previous day off sick, coincidentally, John Rallo came to work on August 19th informing his secretary that his wife had run off with another man, taking his kids with her. The police, however, arrived at his workplace later on in the morning. John's reaction was to say, quote, Hey, I was just going to call you. Are you freaking kidding me? I was just going to call you? I really don't like this guy. As investigators were talking to John, Hamilton police learned of the body of the little girl found outside of St. Catherine's. By 2 p.m. that afternoon, using a family photograph that had been provided to them by the Paulingtons, Inspector Thompson of the Hamilton Police tentatively identified the body as that of Stephanie Rallo. This was later confirmed by the Paulington family, who visually identified the little girl. Inspector W.C. Craig of the Provincial Police said that Stephanie was identified by her grandfather, Doug Paulington chief of the Cambridge, Ontario Fire Department. Unaware that his daughter's body had just been discovered, John was asked to go to the police station for an interview that afternoon. He drove to the police station himself, and according to the Hamilton Spectator, he stopped off at the bank along the way to switch a joint bank account that he shared with Sandra to a sole ownership in his name. In the interview, John claimed that he had been receiving anonymous phone calls from a male caller. 
This caller never identifies himself, but once John says he let it slip that he was a lawyer. These calls apparently started in the summer of 1975, but only came through when Sandra was out of the house. And he claimed the man knew a lot about his family. John stated that he had spoken to Sandra about the calls, and she denied any knowledge about the caller. Strangely, John never changed their number, nor did he tell police about the strange calls until now. Instead, he would attempt to arrange meetings with this strange caller. Okay, if some stranger is calling my house, I know the last thing I want to do is to meet up with them in person. He said he waited outside the courthouse, coincidentally enough, the same courthouse he would eventually stand trial at, but the man never showed. Not only does his story not make sense, he's an exceptionally horrible liar. John was later told that his daughter was dead, and although he hung his head, the detective said that he didn't see any tears. John George Rallo, Hamilton City Hall office manager and secretary of the city's traffic and engineering committee, was arrested and charged with the murder of his daughter, Stephanie Rallo. As he was denying any involvement in the crime, the police went to work on securing the family's home and the Rallo's Ford Maverick to gather evidence. The police took a photo of an unshaven, kind of unkept, scowling John Rollo, age 33, on the day of his arrest. In this full body shot, he's wearing sort of a rumpled mint green leisure suit with owl-type glasses. But aside from the bad 70s fashion, and I mean most 70s fashion is questionable at best, there's just something really freaky and creepy about this photograph. I mean, let's not forget, moments before this photograph was taken, he was just informed that his five-year-old child had been murdered. There doesn't appear to be any grief or sadness in his eyes. There's more of this, like, shocked, angry, oh shit, they caught me sort of look in his face. If anything, he just looks super pissed off. The police took photographs of Rallo's hands on the night of his arrest, and there were cuts, scrapes, and bruises on both his hands and fingers. John claimed that he had fallen off his bicycle while he was riding around in the dark, the night that Sandra and the children had left. He said he hit a brick or stone or something and fell off his bike and injured his hand in the process. So he's going for late night bike rides, he's randomly ripping up carpet at 5 a.m. and he apparently has an answer for everything. In the meantime, police dragged the waterway in the area that Stephanie's body had been found, looking for Sandra Rollo and the couple's six-year-old son, John Jason but they didn't find either of the missing Rallo family members at this time. But weirdly enough, they did find other bodies, just not the ones they were looking for. The badly decomposed body of Julius Sabo, a Hamilton man who had been missing since April and who disappeared on a fishing trip in the spring, was found behind the wheel of his car, submerged in 12 Mile Creek. He apparently had a heart attack behind the wheel and drove off the road. The body of a middle-aged woman who had taken her own life was also recovered. After John handed the keys to his car and home over to the police, the Center of Forensic Science in Toronto was brought in to assist with the investigation. And searches of Rollo's home and car provided some interesting clues. The house was a mess. Furniture was moved around and carpet was torn up. William Tozdiak of the Center of Forensic Science searched the house at Latana Court, and his trained eye spot the remnants of spatters and drops and smears. As well, the beige shag rug in the Rollo Master bedroom had been ripped up, and even the green under padding was gone. John would later testify, quote, the children had been sick on it, and the cat had soiled it, and Sandra complained about the odor coming from this rug. There were seven small blood stains on the drapes of the master bedroom that were later matched to the blood type of Sandra Rallo. The couple's bed had been taken apart and the box spring and the mattress were in the upstairs hallway outside the bedroom. And Rallo's answer for this was he just couldn't bear to sleep in the bed that he shared with his wife, who he had just discovered had been cheating on him. So, on August 17th, he apparently called on sick to work and dismantled the bed. And there were bloodstains on the box spring as well. 
I know everyone handles grief differently, but ripping up carpet in the middle of the night, dismantling furniture, going for late night bike rides. This man is acting incredibly bizarre. An expert later testified that the stains on the drapes and the box spring were consistent with blood being splashed on them with some force rather than being dropped on them. There were also blood stains found on the bare concrete of the basement floor. Investigators determined that this must be where Rallo brought the bodies to wrap them up and dispose of them. There were also blood droplets leading to and in the garage near where Rallo's Ford Maverick would have been, where he most likely loaded the bodies of his family into the trunk of his car after he murdered them. There was blood found on the carpet that fit the bare space of the basement floor, which had been rolled up and placed nearby. There was blood evidence found in other spots of the house as well, telling the story of a brutal murder. And, thankfully for investigators, a really shitty cleanup job. The garbage bag that Stephanie had been wrapped up in was matched by the manufacturer and proven to have come from an open box of bags in the basement of the Rallo home. Detective Codis also spent two days digging through garbage at the dump, where Rollo had admitted being on the day after the murders. A security guard who worked at the dump also remembered Rollo being there that day. He had two boxes and three garbage bags to dispose of. A large piece of bloodied shake carpet that matched the piece that found in the basement was found at the Glanford dump. But a shake carpet stained with blood matching the carpet of the Rollo bedroom was found at a second dump on Ottawa Street. John Rollo, of course, had answers to explain away this evidence, too. Of course he did, because he has an explanation for everything. According to court documents, he said he gave the pieces of the rug and under padding to a garbage picker at the dump. He denied, of course, going to the Ottawa Street dump because there, there was some damning evidence. He said that the blood stains in the master bedroom were from a nosebleed suffered by Sandra while she was playing with Jason. However, blood spatter experts testified that the blood was splattered, not dropped. The smear of the blood found in the garage apparently came from Sandra when she cut her foot, and the portion of the mattress cover that was missing had been cut out by Sandra after Stephanie had thrown up on it, while they were living at a different house, before they moved to Latana Court. As the search continued for Sandra and Jason, a private funeral was held for Stephanie Rollo on August 24, 1976, and she was buried in a local cemetery. But now the Paulingtons had to bury their granddaughter, with the disappearance of their daughter and their grandson still weighing heavily on their minds. But John was their son-in-law, and he had been charged with Stephanie's murder. This had to be extremely confusing for them. How can a father take a child's life? And what had he done with the other two family members? John Rollo had also been involved in a multi-million dollar property development with Doug Paulington. None of this made any sense at all. And then on Thursday, August 26, 1976, another horrific discovery was made. As OPP officers were searching the waterway from a helicopter, they spotted a bundle that was out of place, floating in the water of the Welling Canal. At 12.27 p.m., an officer noted the discovery. It was a green clothed zipper sleeping bag, and the bag was tied with what appeared to be rope and a sash cord. The bag was open at one end, with part of a green plastic garbage bag sticking out the open end. Observed were a pair of feet with the toenails painted red. The rope and sash cord were elaborately tied, each knot related to the next knot. There were two sleeping bags, a blue inner one and a green outer one, with the label sewn into the lining that said Jason Rallo. Stuffed into the two sleeping bags were two anchors, weighing 15 and 20 pounds. Sandra's body was decomposed. Her green eyes were discolored. There was a round hole above her right ear, bruising to her thighs, forearms and face, the tip of her nose was crushed, and there was a red mark on her chest. Her tongue protrudes from between her teeth, typical of strangulation. Doug Paulington then had to ID the body of his 29-year-old daughter, Sandra, 
which had been in the water for nine days, and John Rello was charged with a second count of first-degree murder. It was determined that Sandra had in fact died from asphyxia. The pathologist noted that Sandra had been badly beaten shortly before she died and may have been unconscious due to the severity of the blows before she was strangled. Sandra Rallo was buried on August 31, 1976, next to her daughter Stephanie, who had been enrolled in Peter Pan Nursery School at the time of her death. On October of 1976, police officials called off the search for Jason Rallo, a t-ball player who would now be seven years old. Body or not, John George Rollo was charged with an additional count of first-degree murder, and Jason's body still remains missing 46 years later. He's never been found. But there was a horrific mix-up back in 1977 when the body of five-year-old Jamie Shear, found near Barrie, Ontario, was misidentified as Jason Rollo. They even buried him beside Stephanie and Sandra, but investigators on another case had the body exhumed, and sure enough, it wasn't Jason. To say that Sandra's parents were angry was putting it mildly. Quote, I'm shocked that such an error could be made. I'm at the point where I think some of the people involved were less than professional. Doug Paulington said that he admired the work of the police, but were disappointed in the people with the forensic center. Dr. H.B. Cottenham, Ontario's chief coroner, defended two experts who mistakenly identified the remains as Jason Rallo, saying that the judgment was reasonable based on the information available at the time. Quote, every available method was used when they examined the remains the first time. At the time, there was no other missing child in Ontario that we knew of. And John's reaction to finding out about what was presumably Jason's body was just weird. He didn't seem overly concerned about it. It was most likely because he already knew it wasn't him. In a court appearance, it was ordered that John George Rallo was to undergo a psychiatric evaluation. After 60 days of testing, Rallo was determined to be fit to stand trial for the murder of his family. Remember how I mentioned at the beginning of this video how there were many questionable decisions made along the way in this case? On December 24th, 1976, John Rallo was able to leave custody on $100,000 bail. You heard it right. They let a suspected triple murderer out of jail. He was able to return home to his parents' place for the holidays. They gave him bail. What were they thinking? You know, I often secretly wonder if, um, this goes back to my thoughts on domestic violence. I have to keep reminding myself this took place in the 70s and not in present time. But if John had killed three strangers, would they have given him bail? I guess they gave him bail because the people that he was in danger to were already dead. I don't know. I can't figure that one out. One of the conditions of his release on bail was that he was not to have any contact with the family of his deceased wife. He was also not allowed to leave the Hamilton region except to attend the Clark Institute of Psychiatry in Toronto. He was out of jail awaiting trial for almost a year and most of the people of Hamilton already felt he was guilty. And Rallo's trial was set for November of 1977. According to the Hamilton Spectator, John took advantage of his freedom. Quote, Every day he puts flowers on the graves shared by his wife and daughter, and the one space left for Jason. He goes to Latana Court and mows the grass around his children's swing and walks through the house. He waves at the neighbors, but they don't speak to him. Can you imagine being his neighbor and knowing what happened there and what he's accused of? And yes, I know, innocent until proven guilty, he hasn't been convicted of anything yet. It would take every ounce of restraint I have not to flip that man off. The thing that really gets me, though, is him having the nerve to go to the cemetery and putting flowers on their graves every single day. That is some next-level messed up stuff there. He's either trying not to look guilty or reliving the crimes. I can't figure out which it is. I think in his mind, he thought this was how an innocent person should behave, but this was not at all like an innocent person would behave. 
In January of 1977, John's lawyer sent a letter to Mayor Jack McDonald asking if John could return to work at City Hall, but clearly they didn't want him there. They said no. John George Rollo was born in Hamilton on November 30th of 1942 to Jack and his wife Dorothea. He grew up in the North End before the family moved to the East Hamilton Mountain. Oh, the irony. Jack was an OPP forensic identification officer who photographed crime scenes, but left the force when his son was a teenager and took a job working for the Liquor Control Board. Growing up, John was a mama's boy, always overdressing as if he had a job interview or a date. He was obsessed with girls and spent his free time standing on a downtown corner watching all the girls pass by. After finishing high school by correspondence, he took communications and management at Mohawk College. When he was 20, he met 15-year-old Sandra Pollington, but her family really didn't care for him. They didn't like him because they thought he was too old and Catholic. I know it sounds odd, but I remember this being a thing with my grandparents too. They never wanted me dating anyone who was Catholic. I couldn't figure that one out. It must have been a generational thing. I don't know. The age difference, however, was more concerning, especially when you're dealing with a 15 and a 20 year old. But their daughter was in love, so they eventually gave in. And in 1966, Sandra and John got married. John was now working in Hamilton City Hall in the engineering department, eventually becoming an office manager. John Jason was born on October 30th, 1969, and Stephanie was born on June 30th, 1971. So though John Rollo had a wife and two children, it wasn't enough for him. John always seemed to have another woman in his life. John was not faithful to Sandra. And although not all of John's extramarital relationships crossed the line of sexual infidelity, John ended up having an affair with another married woman in his department at City Hall, and it ended a year before Sandra and Jason and Stephanie were murdered. On November 22, 1977, John Rollo's triple murder trial began. This would end up being the biggest case in Hamilton since the Evelyn Dick trial. The courtroom was packed shoulder to shoulder, people holding their overcoats and brown lunch bags on their laps. Others were lined up down the halls of the court, hoping to nab a seat should anyone leave. The jury selected was made up of nine men and three women. The trial only lasted 16 days, which is pretty short as far as murder trials go. And in their opening statement, the Crown said it was like this. John planned it. He had for months been fabricating a story about a mysterious lawyer hoping to create a scapegoat. The Crown called 48 witnesses and introduced almost 150 pieces of evidence supporting the charges. Also, about a week into the trial, um, after public outrage about John's affairs with married women, his bail was suddenly revoked, which I find so weird. He's accused of killing three people, two of which were children, and people don't lose their minds when he gets bail. But having an affair, and that's where suddenly everyone draws the line? Behind the scenes, the jury was completely unaware that any of this was taking place. The Crown's evidence showed that Sandra and John had fought violently for one reason or another, most likely over his multiple affairs, on the night that Sandra was murdered. John had strangled Sandra with a cord from the drapes. The trial heard that he strangled and beat Sandra with such force that her jaw was crushed. According to the Crown Prosecutor, the children had seen their father's rage and were murdered to get rid of them as witnesses. A pathologist testified that Stephanie was smothered by someone who put two fingers up her nostrils and covered her mouth for 16 minutes. In a Hamilton Spectator interview with Sandra Rollo's mother, she was quoted as saying, When you went to clean up the house, you could still see the indentation in the pillow that her head had made. According to the prosecution, John took the bodies to the basement, stripped them, and put the clothing, along with the bloody linens, in the washing machine. Blood dripped onto his leather slippers. There were smears on the door jamb and the wall that was type B. Sandra had type B blood. After dark, 
He brought the bodies into the garage where more blood dripped. He placed them into the trunk of his car and then drove to dump them in the waterways of St. Catharines. On Tuesday, August 17th, John called in sick. To relieve frustration over his missing family, John listens to the radio and dismantles his bed. He also rips up the beige shade carpet, tears out a chunk of the green under padding under the window, and to pass time, John does laundry. In the afternoon, he goes to Canadian Tire on Upper James to return a light switch. Who returns a light switch? Seriously. And at dusk, he heads out and goes for a drive to random spots that don't make any sense. He said he drove along the beach strip in Hamilton, then Toronto, then Brantford and Caledonia. For those who aren't familiar with these areas, they're not close to each other, with the exception of Brantford and Caledonia. When he was creating this weird, non-existent alibi, um, you'd think he would pick cities that were a tad bit closer in proximity. According to John, when he arrived home at midnight, he took a late night bike ride in the schoolyard and, quote, hits a rut or a stone or a brick or something and fell hard, cutting his hand in the process. On August 18th, John is awake at 5.15 in the morning and vacuums and dusts the house for, quote, simply for something to do. He took three pieces of carpet and one piece of under padding to the Gladford dump off of Highway 6. And at 11.30 a.m., he showed up at his father-in-law's office in Cambridge with the Dear John letter. John was on the stand for two days for a total of five hours testifying in his own defense. There was also a massive snowstorm that hit southern Ontario during this time. But that didn't stop 200 people braving the weather to fill the courtroom to hear his testimony. John stuck to his story that Sandra had taken the kids and had run off with this mysterious lawyer who had been calling their house for over a year. He testified coldly lying, explaining away the bits of evidence that he could. John claimed that he was worried the night his family disappeared and decided to spend that night on the couch of the living room. Quote, I stayed there all night, looking out the window and dozing off, waking up, hoping that if a car came into the window or a cab or something, it was Sandra. Evidence that the jury didn't see or hear included a stack of magazines hidden in a drawer. That included graphic and violent bondage pornography found in the house by police before John was accused of killing his family, before they even went missing, like a year and a half before they went missing. John had groped his sister-in-law, Janice, while she was consoling him for something. The magazines were found by an investigator while they were investigating these charges of sexual assault. It should be noted that some of the intricate knots used to tie women in these magazines also matched those found in the ropes and cords that had been used to bind Sandra when she had been found murdered. The court felt that releasing this to the jury would again prejudice them against John Rollo and could be used in further appeals, so this evidence wasn't allowed. Justice O'Driscoll then gave his instructions to the jury. Quote, If the accused is the man, then you have before you a very cold, calculating, cold-blooded killer who wiped out his family and then tried to destroy the evidence. If the accused is not the person, then he has undoubtedly gone through hell on earth since arrested. And on October 14, 1977, after six hours of deliberation, the jury came back with their verdicts. John George Rollo was found guilty on all three murder charges. John was given a moment to speak before his sentencing. He took this opportunity not to apologize or to take responsibility, but he wanted to express what hardships he had been through. Quote, Well, my lord, in your charge to the jury, you said the past 16 months have been hell for me. What has kept my head above water is that I know I did not do it. But more importantly, I know Sandra knows I did not do it. Stephanie knows I did not do it. And Jason, wherever he may be, knows I did not do it. John was then sentenced to three life sentences to run concurrently without the possibility of parole until serving 25 years. He spent his first Christmas in isolation, 
at the Barton Street Jail, away from the other inmates because they all wanted him dead. The inmates even sent him a Christmas card with the names of his murdered wife and children signed to the bottom of the card. He was eventually sent to Kingston Penitentiary and immediately put into protective custody. On November 23, 1978, the Ontario Court of Appeal upheld John's conviction. And in 1980, the Supreme Court of Canada also turned down his appeal. Three days after the Ontario Appeal Court decision, Inspector Norm Thompson decided to visit John. Thompson was the lead investigator on the murders. He and his wife had become close friends with Sandra Rallo's parents. They even attended a seance together, hoping to learn where Jason's body was. But John isn't interested in answering any questions, and he still claims not to know where his son's body is. Staying true to form, in 1979, while in prison, John met a woman and struck up a relationship with her. All the while, he still denied any involvement in the death of his family. John kept the relationship a secret from prison officials and the Parole Board of Canada. This woman would be listed as a family friend on her visits to see John in Kingston. By 1992, the couple had had four private visits, spending 72 hours in a trailer on the prison grounds. In 1997, John ended up proposing to this woman, and the Parole Board of Canada is still completely unaware of this relationship. It wasn't until there was a passing reference about John's girlfriend in a psychological report that the board learned the truth. These two were apparently in a relationship together for 26 years of his incarceration, and the Parole Board of Canada didn't have a clue, although the relationship did apparently end in 2005. By 1986, John has been approved for temporary escorted absences from prison. I didn't even know this was a thing in Canada. Apparently it is, but it's usually for special circumstances such as a death in the family. But in John's case, some of these temporary escorted absences were used to return to Hamilton to celebrate the holidays with his parents and to attend his parents' 50th wedding anniversary with his cousins and unarmed guards. Who in Corrections Canada approved this? Sandra's parents were not aware of these visits. It wasn't until five years later when people began telling them that they had seen John in Hamilton that they became aware. By the year 1990, the Hamilton Spectator newspaper learned that John Rallo had received a total of 17 escorted temporary absence passes and when Doug Paulington called to report that John Rollo had been seen, police warned Doug that he could be arrested for harassing John. I wish I was making that up. In February of 1990, John was transferred to Beaver Creek Institution, a minimum security facility in Gravenhurst. According to Doug Paulington, Sandra's father, Beaver Creek Institute is almost like a motel where inmates can check in and check out at will. Quote, they golf, they go out on excursions on the lake, they really live the life of Riley, and they're allowed to take escorted absences. Keep in mind, it's only been 15 years since he slaughtered his family. And at this point, he's in a minimum security prison. And then there's the faint hope clause. I've talked about the faint hope clause in other videos and my thoughts on it. The faint hope clause was done away with in 2011, so it's only really an issue for those who were convicted before 2011. Anyone who's been convicted since 2011, the faint hope clause doesn't apply to them. But at this point in the story, we just reached 1990, and John is sitting in a minimum security prison. So back in the 70s, when the Canadian government did away with capital punishment, they quietly introduced the faint hope clause, which thankfully doesn't exist anymore. This clause basically allowed prisoners who were sentenced to life without the possibility of parole until serving 25 years to have their cases reviewed after serving only 15 years. And of course, John Rollo was one of the first inmates to apply for early release under the faint hope clause. The review considers an inmate's character and how they conducted themselves in prison. According to one of his parole officers, quote, John's crime was heinous, yet he was a virtually perfect institutionalized citizen. 
In the end, though, the jury thankfully rejected John's application for early parole. In 1993, the Paulingtons saw John for the first time in 16 years at a parole hearing to determine if his escorted temporary absences would continue. And John made a speech that he would go on to repeat at other parole hearings. Quote, Not a day goes by when I don't think of my children and wonder what they would have accomplished by now. Birthdays, wedding anniversaries, and Christmases are hard. I don't know what happened. I have tried to figure out how it happened, who did it, but I just don't know. And in this hearing, the panel determined that John was allowed to continue his temporary escorted absences. By this point, Doug and Margaret Paulington had become two of Canada's most powerful advocates for victims' rights. They worked with other victims of crime to try and repeal the Faint Hope Clause and supported the French and Mahaffey families during the Bernardo Hamoka trials. Quote, We won't stop agitating, writing, and working to change the laws so people like him have to spend the rest of their life in prison. Of course, as soon as John was eligible to apply for parole in the year 2000, he began applying every two years. He wanted to move to a halfway house in Peterborough, but a citizen's advisory group rejected him because of his lack of remorse. Fortunately, his bid for parole was turned down, as well as his bid for temporary unescorted absences in 2000. The parole board stated that in the 24 years that he had been in prison, there was no appreciable change indicating that he would not reoffend if released. A psychiatrist even said that he was emotionally flat and lacked remorse. So he was turned down again for temporary unescorted absences and day parole and full parole in 2002, 2004, and 2006. And each time at these parole hearings, he never took any responsibility or showed any remorse. And also, every time he applied for parole, Doug and Margaret Paulington would make the horrible trip to prison to beg the parole board to deny John Rollo his freedom. And at each of these hearings, standing in a tiny room with the killer they once welcomed into their family, Margaret and Doug Paulington would stand up and ask John Rollo the same question. Will you tell us where Jason is? They never got that answer. The parole board stated, quote, The parole board continues to be struck by your continual denial. Despite the overwhelming circumstantial and forensic evidence that supports a finding of guilt. By June of 2004, John Rollo is one of Canada's longest serving inmates. In 2007, however, John Rallo did something that he hadn't done publicly in three decades. He cried. I shit you not, that's all it took. Apparently, the Parole Board of Canada is that easily manipulated. The tears came when John spoke of the year after the murder when he was on bail visiting the home where his family died. Quote, I'd go there and cut the grass. I'd go into the house and walk from room to room. I'd miss everybody. I'd miss everything. Beautiful kids, beautiful wife. It's been difficult. John is who he is. So I'm trying not to get mad at that statement. My beef is with the parole board of Canada. I, I still, I, I don't get it. How could they release him? So after crying, this time with tears, John was granted temporary unescorted absences to figure out where he wanted to live. So this piece of garbage only has to cry one time and the parole board caves. I should also point out too that this was the first parole hearing that Doug and Margaret Paulington didn't attend. Apparently they were just too ill to travel. So on August 26, 2008, after almost 32 years behind bars, at the age of 65, John Rallo was granted day parole on his fourth appearance before the Parole Board of Canada. He's never shown any remorse except for that one tear. He's never confessed to the crimes and he's never revealed where Jason's body is and they let him out. It just feels wrong that they released him. So at this point in the story, he's not on full parole, he's on day parole. The conditions of his parole state that he has to live in a halfway house 
He can come and go as he pleases within the community so long as he's back in the halfway house at night. Except on weekends, he was pretty much free to do what he wanted. He even returned to Hamilton for his parents' 67th wedding anniversary. He also must report any new relationships with women to his parole officer. So for 12 years, from 2008 up until 2020, John Rallo remained on day parole. Margaret and Doug Paulington had always said that before they die, they wanted to be able to lay Jason to rest with his mother and his sister. But unfortunately, in 2008, they were not well. Anne had lived to see the man who murdered their daughter and grandchildren gain his freedom. Quote, to this day, the constant ever-growing fear exists in our minds that the body of that beautiful boy will never be found. John had both a car and a suitcase. If he wasn't happy, all he had to do was leave. Sandra's parents fought for more than 30 years to keep John Rallo locked behind bars. In 2011, the Paulingtons passed away only one day apart. In 2013, John Rallo was once again denied full parole. This is unusual because in Canada, if a prisoner is granted day parole, it's usually only one year before they're granted full parole. At this point, John Rallo had been living on day parole for five years. If killing your wife and children isn't domestic violence, what is? Yet apparently John Rallo didn't see it that way. In appealing a Parole Board of Canada's decision to deny the convicted triple murderer full parole, Rallo argued he had no history of domestic violence. Quote, You argued that at no time was the issue of domestic violence ever raised during your preliminary hearing, criminal trial, and subsequent appeal court submission. John Rallo continued to deny that he had marital problems despite admitting that he had affairs, often. He says that he does not have anger management problems despite strangling, beating, and smothering his family. And he still will not admit to where he put Jason's remains because in his mind, he never disposed of them. Fortunately, in 2013, the Parole Board of Canada upheld its decision to deny full parole to John Rollo. David Paulington, the brother and uncle of the victims, said, quote, at no time has John Rallo ever displayed any degree of remorse. So in 2015, Dorothea May Rallo, John Rallo's mother, died on Christmas Eve, and she was 95. According to parole documents, Rallo visited Hamilton regularly. At this point, he was living half of his time in a halfway house and half of the time with a new girlfriend. And at this point in 2015, seven years after he had been granted day parole, he seemed to have given up on the idea of gaining full parole. He's still sticking to his story, he still won't admit what he did, and he's still not showing any remorse for his crimes. At a previous parole hearing, his girlfriend told the parole board, quote, only God knows the truth of what happened to Sandra and their children. So John Rallo moved to Northern Ontario, and after his mother's death, it was decided that he really has no reason to return to Hamilton ever again which is for the best, I don't know if the city has ever fully recovered from what he did. In 2019, it was reported that both John Rallo and George Lovey were both living in the same halfway house in Sudbury. Both are murderers from Hamilton that are unwelcome back in their hometown, strangely enough. John Rallo's refusal to admit his guilt has been the single greatest reason why the parole board has not granted him full parole. The privilege has repeatedly been withheld from him, even though he's considered a model prisoner and has been assessed as, quote, low risk for reoffending violently. He has also been recommended for full parole four times by Correctional Services Canada. Quote, the board has continued to have concerns with your stance of denial with the index offenses, as this suggests your risk factors are unknown and unaddressed. His denial stance also continues to cause serious psychological harm to the victim's families. So as of 2020, he was still doing the part-time gig in the halfway house because he wouldn't own up to his crimes or tell the surviving family members where Jason's body was. And then COVID hit and that changed everything. So John being elderly and in his 70s now was considered high risk for COVID. 
the Hamilton triple killer had been granted medical leave from the Sudbury halfway house. The parole board of Canada decided that for 90 days, John Rallo could live with his girlfriend full time. Sandra's sister Janice has continued to beg John to reveal where Jason's body is. She also begged the parole board not to approve John's medical pass. Quote, he's a triple murderer who savagely killed my family. What is more detestable is that he now wants special consideration. He never showed any consideration or compassion when he killed my family. And once again, the Parole Board of Canada ignored the victim's pleas and granted John Rallo his medical pass. And then on February 19th, 2021, nearly 45 years after killing his wife and two children, John Rallo was granted full parole. He still won't reveal what he did with his son's body, and he still maintains his innocence. He still sticks to this ridiculous story about this mysterious lawyer who stole his family. Despite that there's not one shred of evidence that this man ever existed, he'll be on parole for the rest of his life. He'll have to check in with a parole officer and stay away from the victim's families. And he has to report any new relationship he has with women. But for the most part, John Rollo has been granted his freedom. And the thought of that, in the final moments of his video hearing with the Parole Board of Canada, John Rollo hung his head and cried. And those were quite possibly the only genuine tears of his life. Which brings us to the end of one of Hamilton's most notorious cases. For Sandra's sister, it just feels like a big slap in the face. Quote, The thing that hurts the most is we'll never know where Jason is. That door is closed now. That brings me to the end of this embarrassing, dark stain in Canadian justice. This is a man who should have never been released. So I'm curious to know what you think. What do you think about John Rallo being granted parole and being totally free? Let me know in the comments section below, although try and keep it clean. I know it's difficult, especially since there's children involved in this story. I myself used some very colorful language when I found out he was granted full parole. Thank you so much for watching and I will see you next time.